So the common perception is as follows, that until modern times, history is witness to women being considered secondary, second-class citizens to men. That men have dominated, whether it was in politics, in leadership, in religion, essentially in almost all, if not all, societies and cultures. If you ask anyone what is the biblical view, the religious view, yeah, men are the center, men are the leaders, and women are their accessories at best. And people quote different historical evidence for this, different texts. It's only in recent times, in modern times, that we have the birth of the suffrage movement, we have the birth of feminism, of women claiming and gaining some equality, if not complete equality, but partially whether it's in wages, whether it's in treatment, whether it's the ability to vote. As I said, the perception is that women were accessories, even property, property of their husbands. You'll be surprised to learn that this is the farthest thing from the truth. If we actually go to the Bible, we learn a very different take on women and men, that we could all do well, including in the most of these in, in these modern times, in these most modern times. We could all do well but to learn what the Bible actually says. So let's review that. You open up the Bible, and what does it say? That after God created existence, on the sixth day, he said, let us create a human being in our image, in the divine image. And he went ahead and did that. And what did God do? created the human being, male and female, he created them. Essentially an adragonous creature, male and female. There's no talk about one superior to the other. Then he split them into two, and from there on they go and search for each other, which is the essence of love, to reconnect to their other half, soulmate, and reconnect to the divine image that they both complement. That's the Bible, biblical story. There are verses that talk about that God took, some interpreted the rib, some t- that he took the side of the man, and from that he created the woman. But that's already a second part of the story. The first part of the story is that God created the human being in the divine image, male and female. Two forces, two equal forces. And indeed, when you start reading and studying the mystical and spiritual take on this, that male and feminine, ma- masculine and feminine, male and female, are actually two forms of energy. And both are necessary. One is so-called expressive energy, masculine energy. The other is intimate energy. We all know we, know we need both those forces within us. We have that which is within. We have that which we express. And indeed, why is the man physically stronger than the woman? Is because his role, primary role, is that he can actually be more of a conqueror. He can carry heavier weight. He can chop more wood, carry more water. Whereas a woman's powers lie in developing that which the man brings home, whatever was produced in the field, and the woman bakes, bakes it into bread. He brings home material, and the woman turns it into garments. It's an expression from the Talmud. So they complement each other. And each has their particular strength. Masculine and feminine. The truth is every human being has both masculine and feminine elements. So when you think of it that way, where is there any inequality? It's completely two halves of one whole. Completely complementing each other. So then how did the split become? Where do we find then that men began dominating over women? So some quote the verse in the Bible as well that after they ate from the tree of knowledge, one of the punishments to the woman, the punishment to man, the man was that from, your, from the sweat of your brow you shall now have to eat bread. You'll have to work hard. One of the, the so-called curses or punishments, consequences for the woman, that the man will dominate over you. But that's considered a curse. That's considered a negative consequence. Not the way it was meant to be. So we have to understand what that means. And we'll get back to that. But on a very basic level, 
This tells us two partners in life. Two true partners. So how did indeed there become a dominance of a male hierarchy? And why do we find throughout history, whether it's in religion or in politics or in leadership or in general cultures, that women became so-called secondary? The man dominated. The men dominated. So there's a few factors that we need to take into account. First of all, human nature. When we live in a material world, what do you think is going to happen? If a person focuses on materialism, there's the expression, whoever is more powerful will win. The survival of the fittest. Since a male is physically, physiologically, usually stronger than a woman, he can dominate. Simply on a physical level. He can subdue. He can subjugate the women. And that's what men indeed did. They did it also to each other. Men subjugating other men. Nations trying to conquer other nations. Basically, that's the essence of war and conflict and discord. But also among the genders, it was the woman that suffered most because of her physical strength was usually inferior and weaker than to the man. So the man can subdue her. Or worse, as we know throughout history. So that's really a distortion of how human beings use their strengths. But that's not the essence of what a masculine and feminine, that's why you find in a healthy relationship, they absolutely complement each other. And they both have something the other doesn't have. They both need each other. And in truth, as I mentioned, both the male needs the masculine and feminine dimension functioning within him, and the female needs the masculine and feminine dimensions functioning within her. And as I explained before, these are two forces. These are two divine forces. We actually have a name, a masculine name for the divine, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Kut And we have the feminine dimension of the divine, of the divine and that is Shechina, the Shechina. In Kabbalistic terminology, Zayir Ampin, or Za, is more masculine compared to the sun. And the feminine is Malchus, the dignity, the queen, more comparable to the moon. And they both complement each other. That's the way it is in the archetypal level. But then when it comes into this world, where people can sometimes lose sight of their purpose and mission, and therefore lose sight of the humility and the modesty and essentially the suspension of ego that's so necessary in a healthy enterprise, that's where men start using their power. Now, can a woman use use her power? Yes, women have power as well. But generally speaking, the physical brute strength of a man was able to subdue women. But that's not what the Bible says. When it says that the man who yimshelbach, that he will shall dominate over her, That's considered to be an outgrowth of a negative experience. What happened when they ate from the tree of knowledge? They became self-conscious. Both men and women lost sight of their seamless mission. And now, self-conscious about myself. Once you're self-conscious, then once you identify yourself, then you lost sight of that most important element where male and female both understood that they are equal, selfless partners in a higher mission, higher calling. When that is gone, or at least consciously, when that is lost to some extent, and they betrayed themselves, now, as God says to to Adam in the Garden of Eden, Nayeko, where are you? I don't recognize you. You've wandered away from your calling. And the same thing with the woman. So now to regain that and reclaim your calling, the man will have to work for his living. He will not just get it automatically. And the the woman will have to endure her pains. So the real intention of male dominance was not that the man should dominate over the woman. It was because the, the inevitable and sad consequence of a material world where you lose sight of your mission, where materialism loses so-called its soul, is who's going to suffer most? The feminine energy, the soulful energy, the sensitive, gentle energy. Because the masculine energy can dominate. The goal is that the masculine should protect the women from the hostile forces of materialism. But if it's distorted, the man will use it to control. And that's the meaning of the verse. That it should actually be used to protect, not to control. So in a perfect world, you don't need the protection. The world is aligned. The feminine energy is appreciated for what it is. And the masculine energy is appreciated for what it is. Each one serves a role. As I mentioned before, you need someone to chop the wood. You need someone to shape the wood into a building. 
You need someone to provide the resources, to tame the elements, and you need the other person to build a beautiful home. Not that each one can't participate in the other, but primarily. One provides the seed, the other one carries the child. Nurtures the child for nine months in pregnancy. Each one fitting to their spiritual role and function. But when there's a distortion and there's a dissonance between our mission, our calling, and, between, and, and our divine purpose, between matter and spirit, that's when you have the clash. And men will use their power. And then women will rebel against that power and say, no. It's interesting. There was a time where a career or work itself was not considered a virtue. The philosopher kings had the worker was considered menial, was considered inferior, actually. But then the career became the center of existence. What was the center of existence before that? The home. Both father and mother were building a home. Children. That was the center of existence. Once the men began to glorify and deify their careers and their work, and they left the home, they said, them, what do they need to have a nagging wife and crying children? They can stay at work and go to a bar. Women suddenly realized, hey, you left us alone. If both of us understood the focus of our lives is to build a divine home and to build a home and children, healthy children, and to leave a legacy, to leave a mark in this universe, of goodness and kindness, we're partners. Then you going out to work is a necessity and it's simply to pay the bills. Not an end in itself, but now that you've made work an end in itself and it's lost its divine purpose, so women were suddenly left behind. And of course they'll rebel and say, we also want to have a part of the, we also want to be part of the party. And women began to start emulating and saying, equality is to be like, I'm, like men. Instead of embracing what their real, true, feminine nature is, they began to behave and demand the same rights as men. The truth is they're equal, but they demand the same salaries, the same type of roles. But there are two different roles. This doesn't a woman mean a woman cannot work and be a breadwinner, and a man cannot be at home with children. Again, it's about what's primary. So indeed, from a perspective of the Bible, we're talking about two spiritual soulmates male and female, both dedicated to a cause greater than themselves. But as soon as the self becomes a force, that's when you begin to have the conflict, the battle of the sexes, as it's called. Where are we now? We stand in a place where after years of male dominance, women have began to claim and argue, where are we? Why are we not part of this? The truth is we should be embracing the biblical version, that we should understand that we're truly souls inside of bodies, and our role should be to be to bring that soul's expression into this world. And there's a masculine way and a feminine way, and they complement each other. The feminine way is more nurturing, more internal, more intimate. It's like the energy that flows internally within. And then there's the energy that travels outward that's expressive. And you need both. You need one, two. Sub, sub, sublimate and conquer the elements and transform a material hostile world into something more sublime and then you need the women's gentle spiritual energy to experience the sublime and they complement each other that's the biblical view so it's a tremendous equality a tremendous respect now you may say this is theoretical it's not theoretical I have lived the life I have saw my parents I saw others that live this way Total dedication in that sense. There was no such thing as superior. The whole language, superior, inferior, was completely not even in the, not, not in the ballpark. It wasn't even part of the discussion. Because each one knew their role. Each one, in a very selfless way, fulfilled their role. Do we do it perfectly? We all have our challenges. So it comes down to male and female. God created them in the divine image. Two parts of a divine image. There's so much that can be learned from this in our day and age in the issues of gender. What's the role of a male? What's the role, moral of a female? I have a chapter in my book, Toward a Meaningful Life, where I discuss it at length. So it can complement much of what we're discussing here in this class. Women and men is the title. And there I also talk about a very interesting mystical concept that over the years, yes, men dominated. 
Not for the positive necessarily, simply because they were more powerful. But the truth is, is the feminine energy that always really shaped existence. When push came to shove, it was the women that led the way. And indeed, the mystics say that just as it was when the Jewish people left Egypt, it was the merit of the Jewish women and their faith. Their faith. Faith is more powerful than, we- more powerful than weapons. The faith and the promise, the faith that we will get out of this place, the bigger picture they were able to see. Men sometimes get caught up in the small picture. So the mystics say that at the end of days, after thousands of years of male dominance, the feminine energy will rise and will begin to appreciate that sublime. In a way, you could say technology appreciating the invisible. Once upon a time, we thought size matters. Brute power matters. Armies were defined by numbers, by brute strength, by weapons. Today, we know the most powerful are the ones that have the subtle weapons. It's not size. If you can access the deeper energies, nuclear energy, and so on, you have far more power. So on a spiritual level, the feminine energy is the spiritual energy of existence. Masculine energy is more the, ma- is the, more the physical, the brute strength energy. You need both. Because when you're living in a world, a hostile world, you need to tame the elements. You need to deal with hostile, perhaps, enemies. Protect. But you also need the gentleness, the sublime, the sublime contribution that comes from women. The expression in the book of Psalms is, the dignity of the princess is within. That intimacy that you can't quite measure, but it's so powerful. For a woman, love is a state of being. For a man, it's an act. And they both need each other because we need the expression of it, but we also want that state of being, just being it. So there's a certain inherent sense that women have that they sense something is coming. I remember that big tsunami that happened in, uh, where was it, in, um, in in the Far East. Killed many, many people. Was it Indonesia? I don't remember where it was. Big tsunami. Thousands of people were killed. Interesting thing, most of them were men, not women. The animals had escaped and the women too ran. What was the difference? It was because when, the, before it's, when a tsunami gets closer to land, before it crashes into land, remember a tsunami can travel in deep oceans and no one even notices it. A tsunami could be running 500 miles an hour beneath you if you're out to sea. And you'll just feel a little float here and there. Where's the devastation happens when the tsunami, when the water that's rushing, either due to a volcanic eruption or an asteroid or some other factor that disrupts the water in the oceans. So it rushes as it comes to, to, to uh, landfall, where it begins to come closer to land, that's when the whole, sh- the whole ocean shifts, that boundary, and that's a tsunami. But right before the tsunami comes to the shore, because of its tr- tremendous power, it sucks all the water. So first the oceans recede, literally, like the tide, the, high, the tide goes in all the way. So men came running, curiosity, to see suddenly the seabed and didn't realize what was happening. Women instinctively knew it was a problem. They're not as voyeuristic. They weren't seduced by the external scene. They ran inward, instinctively feeling there's danger coming. They say animals knew even earlier because they sense something when there's a shift. So it's interesting that sometimes that external expression, the masculine, the voyeuristic, which is why, maybe it's not a statistic that we are proud of necessarily, but you find porn is far more followed by men than by women. Because men are very visual, very affected by actions. And women are far more sensual, far more internal. For them, a relationship, love, is a whole experience. It's not just an act. It's not just a moment. It's not a verb, it's a noun. So how much can we learn from that? Tremendous lessons, and that's what happened. Adam and Eve, male and female, they created them, God created them, because each one contributes something. The woman contributes that more sublime, that more... Sent that sensual 
inner intimate side. And the man expresses it. We need both. We need to express the inexpressible. So indeed, from a biblical point of view, counterintuitive and counter to what most of us would imagine, it's quite advanced. And indeed, we are entering into a feminine age where the invisible, where the intimate. Where materialism, raw materialism, is not necessarily more powerful. Where the, where, the love of, where the power of love is stronger than the love of power. That's the world in which we're entering. And we see that. With today, brute strength is not quite as uh, powerful as it once was. It's physically still powerful. But you can be controlling, pressing the right button on a computer, which doesn't take a lot of exertion, and achieve more than someone who's toiling in the field for hours and hours. So what do we learn and what do we derive from this in our personal lives? That first of all, we have to reclaim our feminine and masculine selves. It's not to blur the boundaries. It's not to lose sight of them. It's not for women to become men and men to become women. And I'm not talking about the transgender issue. I'm talking about women playing the, by, the, by the rules of the man or the man having to satisfy women. It's usually the other way around. It's for all of us to claim, reclaim our inner psychological, spiritual, and emotional identities. I remember back in the 70s, I was still probably going on, the Iron John weekends, the idea of men reclaiming their masculinity, going for these weekends where they wear skins and they grunt and they sweat, they climb mountains, bending back to the masculine. Many felt they'd become emasculated, effeminate. So one of the people who went to one of these weekends, and it was an expensive weekend, comes, comes back an executive, and he's talking to his colleagues, his workers, he's telling them how what kind of great weekend it was. It was a lot of money, but he was worth it reconnecting to his masculine side. And I was sweating, and it was great. One of the workers said, boss, if you want to sweat, you don't have to pay thousands of dollars. Just come down to our site, which you own, and work with us. Work with us on a construction site for a while. And you'll sweat. And the boss says, I don't have time for that. I'm busy all week long. I scheduled ahead of time. A scheduled time, I'd go on these weekends, and that's where I would sweat. So he says, boss, if you sweat, when you want to sweat, it ain't sweating at all. So it's interesting how we sometimes try to reclaim, not necessarily always in the right manner. But there is something about each of these forces that are necessary, but above all, what keeps them going and what makes them healthy is their spiritual connection, the spiritual within our masculinity, the spiritual within our femininity, and getting rid of the ego and recognizing we need each other, we complement each other. What a mother gives, a father cannot give. What a father gives, a mother cannot give. Can one compensate for the other? To some extent, but there's something beautiful when you have both. And also in a relationship, each one brings a different dimension. The noun meets the verb. The action meets the state of being. Or well, both are necessary. Sometimes you begin with the action, but then it leads you to a state of being, to just being there. These are some of the lessons we learn from the biblical view on men and women, and hardly anything inferior. The very concept of inferior superior is an ego thing, is a control thing. It has nothing to do with spiritual values because God does not create inferior or superior. Everything has its purpose. That's what we need to re-embrace. So instead of men writing the rules and women trying to conform to them or demanding equality on men's terms, no, let's create equality on our own terms. Let's reclaim what it means to be the quintessential woman, the quintessential feminine energy. Let's reclaim what it means to be the, the, the quintessential masculine energy. And then we can recognize how both complement each other in a beautiful harmony. Soul and body. Form and function. Noun and verb. The expression of love, but also the experience of love. And when we can put our egos aside, or rather, I would say, to suspend them and connect to something deeper, then we get that full harmony. The Talmud tells us in Hebrew, Male and female is ish and isha. 
Ish is male and Isha is the woman. They both consist of three letters. In Hebrew, Aleph and Shin. The difference is by male, it's Aleph Yud Shin, the Yud between the Aleph and Shin. And by woman, it's Aleph Shin He, the He. So the Talmud tells us that Yud and He represent the name of God, Yud He. So on their own, a male and female are Ish, Aleph Shin of fire. Two fires. Two fires are very powerful, can be very strong and very dominant. What keeps them together? What, how do they meld together? They dissolve into each other when you add the Yud and the He of the divine name. You add Bittl. You add that type of modesty, that humility, that suspension of self. It's not just about me, my fire, your fire. There's something in there that transcends the individuality and allows them to see beyond their own needs and therefore complement each other. And what happens when two fires join in a healthy way? Instead of clashing, they melt into one without one compromising the other. That is the true view of male and female. So practically speaking, I definitely recommend reading the chapter of Women and Men in my book, Toward a Meaningful Life. You could check out, we have a whole section on our website, MeaningfulLife.com, more material. And above all, think about it. But let's reclaim our masculine and our femininity. How they're really two parts of one larger whole, which is the divine, the divine being neither male or female, and therefore can bring these two together in a total beautiful harmony and fusion and symphony. This has been Simon Jacobson. Thank you for being with us. From Meaningful Life Center, go to MeaningfulLife.com where you can find more such materials. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, our growing YouTube channel, and please share. Share with your friends. Love to hear your comments, your thoughts, your feedback, questions. And we continue our journey together, finding the harmony within our diversity. A male and female together create something that's more than the sum of the parts. Be blessed and be well. Thank you so much. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com donate.